Thank you for tuning in. This live stream is being recorded. I'm Dr. Konstantinos Yaluridis, and it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the second episode of this webinar series on rising sea levels, promoting climate justice through international law. This is brought to you by BICO with the kind support of landmark chambers. Now, in the previous episode, we saw that sea level rise is an increasing problem of global concern. We also saw that the International Law Commission of the United Nations is studying the various legal issues that would arise if the current legal frameworks are not updated, including the real prospect of states disappearing beneath the waves due to climate-induced sea level rise. In its report, the commission suggested that the international community needs to prepare itself for fundamental legal changes, that international law will have to react and eventually adapt to sea level rise. Yet several practical questions remain unanswered. Take as an example, the Republic of Kiribati, an independent island nation in the Pacific Ocean. Kiribati consists of 33 islands. It controls 1.5 million square miles of ocean territory. That's about 5,000 times the size of its land territory. Yet several of its islands are on the verge of going under. In fact, two islands are already submerged. Would Kiribati's shrinking territory imply reduced maritime rights for the state and by implication for its people? If the entire territory of Kiribati was to become submerged, and the population of that state forcibly relocated to another state or perhaps to a giant artificial island nearby, what would, that would still be the Republic of Kiribati. And if giant installations or seawalls along its coasts were urgently needed to protect Kiribati's territory and infrastructure from rising sea levels, who should pay for these sea defenses, considering especially that climate change is an issue of global concern. These are important questions which implicate international law. And in fact, several climate vulnerable states have already expressed their intention to pursue an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice to address those questions. However, this course of action was not actively pursued for some reason. It is against this background that we are excited to kickstart this discussion today, which focuses on rising sea levels and the role of the ICJ. Could climate vulnerable states seek an advisory opinion from the ICJ? Should they do so? What are the opportunities and risks? And assuming an advisory opinion is pursued, what would be the precise question or questions posed to the ICJ? Now, I'm extremely honored and delighted to introduce you to our fantastic panelists who have kindly agreed to take us through these issues. Professor Zanakopoulos of Oxford University, a general international law expert who has published extensively in the field and has assisted governments, international organizations and other entities on matters of international law, including in relation to ICJ advisory proceedings. He is joined by Professor Wiwerike Singh of Leiden University. She is a human rights and environmental justice academic and practitioner, author of multiple publications in the field, and co lead of the Fighting Climate Change Project of the World Commission on Environmental Law. Dr. Sharok an expert in human rights and environmental law and currently a barrister at Landmark Chambers London. He has acted for claimants in several widely reported environmental challenges, including in the UK High Court. And last but not least, our young scholars, Jules Schnackenberg and Aifi Fleming, representing the world's youth for climate justice. Jules studies LLB with English law at the University of Aberdeen and Aifi is completing a master's degree in financial law at Leiden University. We are of course eager to hear more about their campaign. Now, 
I would like to give the floor to Professor Zanagopoulos to start off today's discussion. Professor, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Konstantinos. Uh, thank you, um, everyone, for joining this um, really uh, important seminar organized by uh, uh, the British Institute um, with an extremely interesting question um, that has to do not just with the uh, rising sea levels, which is uh, obviously a, one of the most important, if not the most important problems uh, of, uh, of our time, uh, but uh, also in combination as to whether um, this should go before the ICJ um, through the advisory jurisdiction of the court, whether we should uh, be trying to get um, an advisory opinion. Now, I don't want to take too much of your time, and I'm sure that many of you um, will uh, be very familiar with the background, but it is, um, well, not often, but it is uh, understood that you might try and use the advisory jurisdiction to the ICJ to get to get answers to to um, to legal questions like this. Uh, I mean, um, the nuclear weapons advisory opinion immediately springs to mind, but we've had questions relating to Kosovo, uh, questions relating to the um, separation barrier uh, between Israel and the occupied territories and questions um, relating to uh, decolonization and uh, the, the Chagos archipelago uh, uh, coming before the court um, as, as really important, in a way, global questions um, that require an answer. The, um, the issue is that we don't always get an answer, or at least we don't always get a helpful answer. So um, it depends. Maybe I'm getting old and I'm and, and getting a bit cynical. Um, I, uh, advisory opinions will give you really important uh, points of law that you then discuss, uh, that you then rely on in later cases, um, that make good teaching material for um, uh, for your international law courses, but whether they actually um, help you achieve anything in practice is is very questionable. So, um, so we. Um, we're going to try and broach this uh, in, in this discussion, and we're going to focus on whether uh, how you can ask. You can always ask. The question is how you can ask um, the ICJ to give you an advisory opinion, um, but also whether you should um, and what problems may emerge. Uh, and, and this can be quite critical because if you ask the wrong question, um, then you'll either get an unhelpful answer or you'll give the court a way out um, and so on. But even if ask, asking the right question might not help, because the, the court, of course, has the power to interpret the question that it gets um, uh, from the organ that it gets. So it get, can interpret its way around um, the whole thing. So, um, so I was looking at, for Palau, for example, was asking, was thinking of asking what the rule of law means in the context of climate change. And that, that already is a bad way to put it, because I mean, it, 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 it sort of presumes that Palau knows what the rule of law is, which would make me um, very interested in their view, because I, I don't quite know what the rule of law is. Um, um, or questions like um, state responsibility for transboundary harm caused by greenhouse gas emissions and caused alone um, is such a giant loophole um, that can literally allow the court to do whatever it wants. So. Um, causation um, would be um, an interesting sort of and very difficult issue to broach um, in that context. But um, let me not take any more of your time after um, introducing sort of the major, um, the background to the whole thing. Um, I think we should uh, move on straight with our discussion. And I'm going to first give the floor to Jewel and Ifa to introduce um, their, their initiative and their campaign um, and tell us what they would like uh, to ask the ICJ and what they, what they hope the ICJ would answer. Um, and then uh, we'll move on to um, our experts first, Margarita, and then um, Alex, uh, who are going to um, focus on different aspects of uh, uh, the problems and opportunities that may arise in that context. So without further ado, um, uh, uh, Jewel and Ifa, I don't know which one of you wants to go first or how you've organized this, but um, welcome and please go ahead. 
Perfect. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction. It's great to be here as a as such a young person. I was just thinking during the introductions, I'm probably the only person on the panel and in the room potentially who who's still working to get her first university degree. So it's great. Uh, I'm we're very grateful for the opportunity to to speak and present our our ideas. And I'm very grateful for all, all the support and the um, that we've received and the confidence that other people have placed. Um, in us, and I'd like to say that uh, we would have liked our colleagues from the from the Pacific who's who started this initiative to to be here and present this to you today. Um, but unfortunately, because of the time difference and and the specific date, they couldn't make it. Um, so we are we are closely collaborating with them, and we drafted our contribution today today together. So um, yeah, we we're just uh, here today to represent um, the the world's youth really for for this the whole global uh, campaign was standing behind this. Desertification, air pollution, coastal erosion, droughts and storms and loss of freshwater resources are just some of the climate crisis impacts that are now directly infringing on our basic human rights. The human rights of people living in communities on the front line of the climate crisis are already being violated today. The rights to life, housing, food and healthcare are infringed by climate change impacts every single day. Vulnerable groups are facing the brunt of the climate crisis disproportionately. And yet, global society continues to implement sustainable solutions at no more than glacial pace. In 2011, the climate vulnerable Pacific Island state of Palau attempted to take climate change to the International Court of Justice. They were seeking clarification on the obligations of states to cut greenhouse gas emissions to avoid transboundary harm. Palau's attempts were unsuccessful. The United States back then economically blackmailed Palau to withdraw their request for an advisory opinion. A few years later, states from all around the world came together for the Paris Agreement, inviting states to voluntarily commit to emission reduction targets. But so far, states' contributions have not been ambitious enough to reach the 1.5 degree target agreed upon in Paris. So in 2019, 27 law students from the University of the South Pacific were inspired by Palau's initiative and their leadership and came together to form the Pacific Students Fighting Climate Change. They've built upon Palau's campaign with a new focus, human rights and climate change. In the same year, the PISF CC proposal was tabled by the Vanuatu government at the Pacific Island Forum. There, the 18 member states of the Pacific Island Forum noted positively the proposal for United Nations General Assembly resolution seeking an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on climate change and human rights. Although a crucial step in the right direction, in order for the resolution to be successful, there must be a simple majority vote by the 193 member states of the UN. Recognizing this reality, the advisory opinion campaign has, grow has grown beyond the Pacific, where Pacific youth and partners are working tirelessly to galvanize support both regionally and internationally. Youth from around the world have united in this mission under the youth-led umbrella organization World's Youth for Climate Justice. And law students from several universities around the world are working under the supervision of their international law professors on academic and legal research. They are generating and formulating strong arguments for their respective governments on why they ought to support the advisory opinion on climate change and human rights. We are seeking to build a strong global narrative that will make it politically, socially, and also if argued well by students and supporting national lawyer, lawyers, legally difficult for states to openly vote against the advisory opinion. As was mentioned before, the question is very important and what we would like the court to answer to is, um, is really focusing on climate justice and what that means. So while any future question must inevitably be the subject of the extensive thought and negotiation, we suggest that a, the question would seek the court's opinion on all aspects of international law relevant to climate change with a focus on the protection of human rights. To illustrate such a rights-focused question, uh, we are looking, for example, at what are the obligations of states under international law to protect the rights of present and future generations against the adverse effects of climate change. Human rights are protected in several international legal documents and human rights are anchored in the Paris Agreement, um, yet those protections are scattered across different declarations and reports. They have rarely, if ever, been used as an argument to propel governments into more ambitious action. 
and the evidence is on our side. We are more than optimistic that the judges in The Hague will understand the urgency of the matter at hand and deliver not just a comprehensive summary of existing obligations, but rather a progressive interpretation of those. And I think this is where the World's Youth for Climate Justice uh, and all the young people working around the world to uh, really build pressure, uh, civil society pressure, will play a big role in that. And there's another place where youth plays a very important role. We must make sure and lobby for the inclusion of certain principles in the final question coming from New York. We see the role of the citizens movement here to be one that will make sure that the question is not watered down. Furthermore, once the question does reach The Hague, just as the campaigners for the nuclear weapons advisory opinion did, we want to continue to remind the judges of the importance and the urgency of the question at hand. And we believe in that way, if they feel the world is watching them, it will be a lot, lot harder for them to uh, give an advisory opinion that is unhelpful to the, uh, to the international, uh, to international law. We, the world's youth for climate justice, do not accept the fate of an unjust, unequal and unsustainable future. The advisory opinion campaign signals to the world a concrete and well-justified catalyzer for more ambitious climate action. We believe it is time the UN court delivers its opinion on climate justice and the protection of future and current generations from the adverse impacts of the climate crisis. Luckily, this is not only a dream. We have already secured support of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment and the High Commissioner for Human Rights. They recognize the power and youth using the international legal system to their own protection and to, the, to those of the generations coming after us. We look forward very much to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, both of you. Um, I guess we should uh, not delay getting into uh, um, the, the difficult aspects of uh, some of the things that you wish to do. I should say that in the meantime, um, welcoming all our um, participants and attendees that you can uh, use the chat function to um, ask questions as we go along if you um, if you like that and then I will um, at uh, at the end of the presentations uh, call upon you um, to um, uh, to to um, ask your question um, live if you wish or I can ask it for you if you prefer that uh, but um, without Delaying any longer, I'm now going to uh, uh, pass on to uh, to Margarita, um, <clears throat> and um, um, and and I would like to, if I can, Margarita, sort of just ask you straight up uh, to address a couple of issues. Like, for example, um, how could do you think climate vulnerable states? Um, seek, uh, seek an advisory opinion uh, from the ICJ or generally how could we, um, how do we end up in the situation where the, um, where the ICJ um, is requested to give an advisory opinion? Uh, can, you, can you enlighten us on that in the first instance? Sure, and um, thank you very much, um, Antonio, and thank you also to uh, the organizers of this, uh, of this event for bringing us here together. And thanks uh, Eva and Jude for your very inspiring introduction. Um, so on the question of how, how could this happen? Well, the basis um, for this initiative is of course the UN Charter. So the UN Charter authorizes all organs of the United Nations to request advisory opinions from the ICJ. First and foremost, the UNGA and the Security Council. The Security Council is an unrealistic option given the likelihood that at least one of the P P5, permanent five members of the Security Council would use, use their veto power or threaten to use their veto power to try and block the initiative. Um, and um, other organs of the UN, um, as well as some specialized agencies that have been authorized to request advisory opinions from the ICJ by the UNGA, um, they may request advisory opinions that fall within their scope of competency and the UN General Assembly may request um, opinions on any legal question, just like the Security Council. Now, whichever, uh, whichever route is, is chosen, um, securing a request will require an orchestrated diplomatic campaign to secure state support in the first place and to reach consensus on a meaningful question. And that's the hardest part. 
Um, the UNGA route is probably the most attractive given the wide range of legal questions that, that the UNGA, UNGA could potentially pose to the courts. Um, and the UNGA would also give higher visibility to the initiative um, and thus the, um, increase the impact of the diplomatic campaign. It's also a very inclusive route because all states um, will be able to provide their views on the formulation of the question at the diplomatic stage. Uh, stage and also um, can um, participate in, in the judicial proceedings. Um, so the, the focus on the UNGA that the youth movement um, has, has chosen seems uh, strategic. What, what, does this, what, this, what does this route like, look like in practice? Well, <clears throat> as, um, as Antonio has already men mentioned, um, the UNGA would need to adopt a resolution supported by a majority of UN member states. And that can be a simple majority of 97 member states. And states that abstain from voting are considered absent. That means that the number of um, votes required to adopt the resolution may be even lower. So in the past, um, resolutions requesting advisory opinions have been passed with simple majorities of 78 or 77 votes in favor. Now, what are the, um, the opportunities and the risks of um, going down this route? Let's start, let's start positively with opportunities. So first of all, the campaign. The campaign itself is an opportunity. Even if it's unsuccessful, it doesn't result in a request. The, the campaign would underscore the, the urgency and, and importance of enhanced um, action to address climate change and its consequences that are already being suffered um, in around the world, but specifically in climate vulnerable states and the injustice of that. It would highlight the potential role of international law and litigation in holding states to account for climate action and inaction or failure, failure to address the consequences. Um, now, if the advisory opinion is actually secured, then it could, of course, it could clarify, uh, states, clarify states' existing obligations on the international law and contribute to the prog progressive development of international law. And that could be in a particular area or areas, depending on how the question is formulated. So um, I won't go into much detail. This can easily be, and you can easily write a book about the various options here, but just to, to um, touch on a few areas where um, a question could potentially be located. So it could be, for example, about the level of mitigation ambition and due diligence required of states uh, and the meaning of equity and common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities in this context. So not only the question of how much should states do, but also the question of how, how burdens should be shared between states. Very tricky issue that the climate regime leaves largely unresolved. Um, then obligations related to loss and damage. As we know, in the Paris Agreement, states included, agreed, agreed to include an article on loss and damage, Article 8 of the Paris Agreement, but the accompanying COP decision in paragraph 52 states that, um, that uh, the, the Paris Agreement doesn't provide any basis for liability and compensation. So liability and compensation are, for now at least, outside of the scope of Article 8. So how is this dealt with then on the international law and how does the law of state responsibility potentially come into play? And then, of course, very importantly, as, as Jules and Eva highlighted, obligations on the international human rights law, as well as the law of the sea. And of course, a question could be formulated in a way that it deals with these different areas of law um, at once. Now, however the question is formulated, the, the opportunity really is to demonstrate that states do not have unfettered discretion in addressing climate change and its consequences, and that they are bound by existing obligations that require certain action. Um, so that, that would be a valuable contribution. Now, how would that then met, how would that really matter in practice? Well, of course, there's the societal impact of increased attention to climate change and climate justice that you already get from the campaign and the further you get in the process, the, the more that attention. And, but the, the, the opinion itself could also have impact in other areas. And I'd like to highlight three the first is, st is state practice. 
So even though, of course, advisory op opinions from the ICJ are not legally binding, um, states and even private entities may be expected to take the, the considered views of arguably the highest court in the world into consideration when they formulate climate uh, policies. Um, and then climate litigation. Climate litigation is booming. You can say we can count more than 1600 climate cases today that have been filed or that are pending. Many are still pending. Many will still be filed in the future. And the ICJ's views on climate change will almost certainly be considered and relied upon in many of these cases. And then finally, the climate negotiations or the implementation of the of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement. So for example, an, an advisory opinion could provide important benchmarks and yardsticks that could inform um, the global stock take in 2023, where states um, review uh, the, the progress towards the, the goals of the Paris Agreement, as well as the second round of NDCs, national, nationally determined contributions, those are the voluntary climate pledges that states um, must make under the Paris Agreement. And the second round of these NDCs is due in 2025, as uh, Jules and Yves uh, emphasized. Current levels of, of, of ambition really fall short. How do you get? How do you raise ambition in a way that respects the, the principles of um, the UNFCCC? Um, that could the, the ICJ has potentially a role to play there. Now, what are the main risks? But for the UNGA route, the main risk really is um, probably not securing the requisite number of votes, at least not, not without losing the core, um, the, the substance of the question. This, clear, this risk is clear from Palau's initial attempt to go down the UNGA route, which got us some way, but not all the way to the end. We may speculate that today the circumstances for securing the requisite majority um, while maintaining a strong question are perhaps more favorable than they were back in 2012, but the, the risk of not getting, getting there, uh, the risk is still real, given the widely different, different interests at stake and the significant chance of pushback from powerful states. And then there's a risk of the court declining to provide an advisory opinion. In my assessment, that risk is not very high if the question is posed by the UN General Assembly and carefully formulated so that it is obviously a legal question. Um, the risk would be higher if the request would come from another organ or specialized agencies, as it would need to fall within the scope of competence. And we have a bad precedent there, of course, in, um, in the court's finding that it lacked jurisdiction to render an advisory opinion on the legality of nuclear weapons in armed conflict requested by the WHO in 1993. Um, a request by a specialized agency or organ from, for an advisory opinion on climate change could be distinguished perhaps from that precedent or based on various grounds, but the safest way to avoid this jurisdictional obstacle would probably be to go down the UNGA route. And then finally, there's a, a significant risk also of the court delivering an underwhelming or an unhelpful opinion, but the risk of an underwhelming opinion can perhaps be reduced by formulating the question as precisely as possible, um, thus um, yeah, increasing the chances that the court will provide a specific answer. Of course, if it's a very vague answer, it will, that, that will be um, yeah, of very limited use, um, but a very specific answer can also be extremely unhelpful. Um, now, I understand that Alex is going to say a little bit more about the court's jurisprudence and provide some thoughts on how the question should be formulated to mitigate the risks and to maximize the opportunities for success, both at the diplomatic and legal stages. And after that, we'll have time to discuss these and other questions with all of you. Thank you uh, uh, very much, uh, Margarita. Um, um, in that case, uh, shall we uh, move on to Alex now that we're on a roll and uh, instead of attacking the issues head on? Um, um, Alex, you have the floor. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you, Professor. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for organizing this. Um, and in particular, thank you to Liam in the background, who's making this, this all work. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I can't help but feel like something of an interloper um, in such esteemed company 
um, some of the most inspiring student activists um, in the world today um, and free of academia's leading lights in public international law um, and then me a domestic environmental lawyer so I'll do my very best not to embarrass myself but please do be kind. I understand that I have about 15 minutes so I'd like to divide my remarks into um, two sections if I may. Um, first how the ICJ um, has dealt with environmental issues in the past um, before turning to the question of uh, the question you know what do we ask um, the ICJ if we get the chance and what some of those difficulties might be and um, building on my previous panelists um, discussion. Before I start, I should also mention I've been assisted greatly by my mini pupil Declan Harris, who provided me with a useful note on the Pulp Mills case and climate justice and helped me download several papers. This has been particularly useful as I'm now locked out of the many online resources I once took for granted as a, a PIL researcher. So thank you, Declan. Um, so first, how has the ICJ dealt with environmental issues in the past? I'm going to go for some of the notable um, cases with environmental elements. No doubt there are cases that I've missed that we can discuss. These are the ones that seem to me to be particularly relevant um, and potentially set the groundwork for a future advisory opinion. Um, so firstly, we've already heard mentioned the 1996 advisory opinion on nuclear weapons. Um, this was a much criticized opinion on whether using nuclear weapons was ever permissible in international law, um, maintaining them and using them. It was criticized because the court effectively said um, broadly that maybe under some circumstances it would be okay to use them. But the court touched briefly on the environment and said something interesting. Um, there's one quote I'd just like to pick out. It said, the general obligation of states to ensure that activities within their jurisdiction and control respect the environment of other states or of areas beyond national control is now part of the corpus of international law relating to the environment. Um, so we have there an early recognition, 1996, that obligations are owed to the wider environment under international law um, in respect of activities done um, within um, a state's borders. Next, I'd like to um, mention the uh, Gabsikovo Dam case, Hungary um, versus Slovakia from 1997. Um, this was about um, a treaty committing both countries to the construction of dams um, on the river Danube. Um, Hungary backed out, uh, ostensibly due to environmental concerns, um, and then Czechoslovakia pressed on um, with a variation to the dam project that redirected much of the river's waters, um, and you can see where this is going. Um, Hungary said they were able to back out of the treaty, um, and then the now Slovakia um, owed the money effectively for, for pinching their source of electricity. Um, the ICJ in its judgment um, basically bashed both their heads together and said both of you have acted unlawfully, um, Hungary backing out and Slovakia for building the variant. What's interesting for us is that the court confirmed that ecological concerns did constitute an essential interest of a state that could potentially um, exonerate a state of its responsibilities um, where it has failed to implement a treaty, um, just not in that particular case. So it's quite interesting if states, um, for, for example, say, oh, well, we'd love to decarbonize, but we have treaty obligations that prevent us from doing so. Um, also in this case, there's a famous separate opinion of Judge Wiramantri on EIA and sustainable development, which is also well worth a read. Turning now um, to the Pulp Mills case, this is Argentina versus Uruguay um, from 2010. Um, this is another river treaty case. Um, Argentina said that in breach um, of a treaty between them, um, Uruguay had failed to notify and consult it before building some pulp mills um, upstream. Um, and the court agreed. Um, however, Argentina also said, hang on, you've caused environmental damage um, with these mills. Um, but the court said, well, there's no evidence of that. Um, and interestingly, um, judges um, Alcasorna and Simmer in their joint dissenting opinion, um, and Judge Yusuf in his separate opinion, they all commented um, that some expert evidence procured under Article 50 of the ICJ statute would have been useful here. It's um, a little used power and likely to be valuable um, in any environmental case before the ICJ with a lot of technical evidence and particularly regarding environmental damage um, or causation. Um, so that's Article 50 of the ICJ statute. Um, what's also helpful for us in this case is the court said at paragraph 204 that one of the treaty obligations in question reflected, quote, a practice which in recent years has gained so much acceptance among states that it may now be considered a requirement under general international law to undertake an environmental impact assessment um, where there is a risk that the proposed industrial activity may have a significant adverse impact in a transboundary context. 
So this idea that EIA is becoming part of customary international law, um, but the court is only toying with this idea, really. They don't come out and say it's a biting norm of customary international law, uh, and they say it's for states to determine how they do it um, in any event, but still a, a promising sort of springboard for a potential um, advisory opinion in the future. Um, I turn now to more, the more recent whaling in the Antarctic case, Australia um, versus Japan with New Zealand intervening from 2014. This touched very lightly on environmental law, um, particularly Judge um, Cansado Trindade's separate opinion, um, but really this case was about a narrow treaty interpretation question. Um, Japan had a practice of issuing permits that allowed killing a certain number of whales for research purposes um, and then allowing the meat to be sold um, and of course eaten. Um, the question was whether this was in line with Japan's international legal obligations under the International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling. Um, the court held no. Um, and as we know, Japan withdrew from the convention um, in 2019. Um, I won't say much more about this one, but it's notable Judge Kansado Trindade, um, in his opinion, um, talks about intergenerational equity, as he did in his separate opinion in Pulp Mills um, as well. And this links to the broader question of climate justice that we, that we heard about earlier. I mean, he says at 47 of his opinion, um, intergenerational equity uh, marks presence nowadays in a wide range of instruments of international environmental law and indeed um, of contemporary public international law. Um, so one judge at least edging towards this idea of intergenerational equity as a norm of customary international law. Um, and this will be increasingly important in the next 50 years um, in my view. Turning next to certain activities carried out by Nicaragua in the border area um, and also construction of a road in Costa Rica. These were joint cases in 2015 and 18. There was a liability um, judgment and a compensation judgment. Um, this is, of course, my second favourite Nicaragua case in the ICJ. Um, this was about um, development um, across the border between Nicaragua and Costa Rica. Um, Costa Rica was exonerated from any violation of international law. But the court held that Nicaragua had breached its international obligations um, by excavating several canals, among other things, um, which had affected the rich biodiversity of the area in question. Um, the parties were given an opportunity to agree damages, um, but they couldn't. Um, so this case is interesting because it establishes damage to the environment um, and the consequent impairment or loss of the ability of the environment to provide goods and services is in principle something that can be compensated under international law. Um, and this compensation judgment, as I understand it, is the first time the ICJ addressed the question of compensation for environmental harm. Um, interestingly, the court says um, that international law does not prescribe any specific method of valuation for the purposes of compensation for environmental damage. Um, but I think this might just be a recognition that it was the first time they'd done something like this before. More cases along these lines will hopefully lead to some sort of um, method or framework for this. There are also some interesting discussions in the separate opinions um, about punitive or exemplary damages. Um, Judge Bandari argued in his separate opinion, and um, the law of international responsibility ought to be developed to include awards of punitive or exemplary damages in environmental cases. Um, for, so food for thought there. Um, I just briefly flag as well um, the, the wall opinion, probably not enough time to go into it, but I, I just mention it just because it shows the court isn't afraid um, to go to difficult places and wrestle with difficult um, issues, at, at least at least in that case. Um, and I suggest if they can give an opinion um, on a wall in Palestine, they can certainly give us an opinion um, on rising sea levels. So that summary is hopefully helpful when we start talking about the opinion we want um, on rising sea levels and some of the jurisprudence um, that it might build, build on. Um, Obviously, there are a number of different questions that could be asked, multitudes really, um, and we can discuss alternatives um, in the Q&A perhaps, um, but some options um, might be, and I'll discuss each of these briefly. Um, one, the legal status and content of the principle of sustainable development um, in PIL. Um, two, legal responsibility of states for transboundary harm caused by carbon emissions um, and two, the, sorry, three, the status and content of various international commitments on climate change. And I'm thinking in particular Paris Agreement, um, Article 8 and Article 9, as we've um, just discussed. So I start with sustainable development then. Um, now, I remember about a year ago, uh, my roommate in Chambers, um, Landmark Chambers, said to me, Alex, you know international law, don't you? Um, to which I said, I know a bit. Um, and he said, well, to what extent is sustainable development a principle of customary international law? Um, and what does it mean? 
Um, to which I said, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, I can lend you some textbooks. Um, he was working on the Heathrow Airport litigation um, in the UK. And one of the judges was taking an interest in the public international law aspects um, of the decision, although it didn't eventually get much airtime um, in the judgment. Sustainable development is a term that's thrown about a bit, but it's not quite clear what it means in terms of binding obligations, particularly in the international law sphere, and particularly in the context of rising sea levels um, and carbon emissions. And the Heathrow case I just mentioned was um, partly about carbon emissions. Sustainable development is one of those terms and that is sufficiently broad, you might well get a court to agree that it's a norm of international law, um, but because it's so broad, query whether an advisory opinion on sustainable development would actually be useful um, unless it states what the po positive obligations are uh, that bind states. Um, and I note um, Brownlee, at least, uh, from Beyond the Grave, um, says that given the breadth of the concept, it might be better understood as a collection of legal categories, sustainable, de sustainable development, rather than a freestanding legal principle. Um, and I'm not so sure, perhaps. Um, it seems to me a case can be made that sustainable development is analogous with intergenerational equity, um, as discussed by Judge uh, Cansado Trindade um, in Pulp Mills um, and Whaling. So the next potential question, we could ask something relating to the legal responsibility of states for transboundary harm caused by carbon emissions. And we could link that to my um, second favorite Nicaragua case. And we're talking here about ideas of polluter pays um, and internationally wrongful acts. Um, and here we can use perhaps Paris um, as evidence of this newly emerged norm. The difficulty is though, we want the ICJ to grapple with some of the causation and compensation issues too. Um, and they are difficult. Um, how do we allocate blame for rising sea levels? Um, we might point to the biggest polluter countries like China, the US and India, um, but China and India at least um, can say, uh, indeed they do say, hang on, uh, the West has been polluting since the industrial revolution. This is all a bit unfair, isn't it? Um, so do we go with overall pollution over a longer period of time? Um, or is it from a point in time where the obligations are said to crystallize, um, in which case we need to establish that? And the trick will be to try and capture some of that in the question so that the answer we get again is not hopelessly vague. Um, related to this, of course, we have the causation problem. All states contribute, but quite what the level of contribution is um, and how it should be compensated um, it is a difficult question. One solution to this kind of problem, though, might be how we did it in the UK. Um, with a, a, disease, a disease that I struggle to pronounce, a mesophilioma, um, an aggressive cancer caused by asbestos. Um, there were a number of cases in the UK where it was found lots of employees contributed um, to the cancer through asbestos exposure, but it was hard to say who caused it um, and how liability should be apportioned. Um, but in Fairchild and Glenhaven, um, House of Lords case, now Supreme Court, 2002, um, the UK House of Lords held the appropriate test for causation um, for mesophil mesophilioma victims um, should not be the standard but for test, which we're all familiar with, but rather one of material contribution to the risk of injury. Um, so you don't need to ask, did you cause it? Only did you increase the risk of it happening? Um, and then on liability, the Compensation Act 2006 established joint and several liability. Um, so you can go after one employer and then they can go after um, everyone else. Um, this approach has some support in international law and Article 47 of the ILC draft articles on state responsibility, uh, which provide in respect of wrongful acts where several states are responsible for the same act, the responsibility of each state may be invoked in relation to that act. Um, and paragraph eight um, of the commentary um, to that article is quite interesting because it gives a pollution example. So several states might contribute to polluting a river um, by the separate discharge of pollutants. So, and then finally, as a, as a third potential question in the mix, we have something regarding the customary status of some of the obligations um, in the Paris Agreement. Um, and this would be useful as it could establish a point uh, along the lines of my favourite Nicaragua case in the ICJ, the Article 2.4 case, um, which held that quite apart from Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, um, prohibition on the use of force was customary. Um, and so we could establish the customary status of something provided for in one of these international agreements and um, give it a bit more bite and protection against um, regression. And the kind of regression I'm talking about is for example, the US um, pulling out of the Paris Agreement or other states pulling out in the future. Um, and if we want to get more specific, I have in mind in particular, the content of the duty of cooperation and the provision of financial resources to states suffering from climate change effects that we see in Article 8, 3 and 9, 1 um, of the Paris Agreement. Um, what do they mean? What do they entail in, in respect of the Pacific Islands? Could be useful um, to get some clarity there. Um, 
just finally then in terms of general risks we need to be aware of um, obviously Paris is largely dependent um, on goodwill um, so we don't want to provoke an angry backlash but um, I doubt the ICJ would go that far in environmental opinion and the other risk of course which has been touched on is that we get an ICJ opinion that's entirely unhelpful uh, and Philippe Sands um, mentions this in his famous 2016 article climate change um, and the rule of law um, for my part, there's an old saying at the uh, the English bar, don't ask a question if you're not sure what the answer will be. Um, and that refers mainly um, to cross-examination and highlights the risk of getting an answer that puts you in a worse position than if you'd never asked. Um, and one can see how that might apply to the ICJ. Um, any legal case is a gamble. Um, it's why I advise many of my clients to settle. Um, you can never predict what judges will say, um, which is in many ways unfortunate um, because he even some of that offhand comments can echo through history. Um, that being said, um, I do think the international consensus is such that after years of discussion, um, now is the time um, to ask for an opinion. Um, now is our best chance of getting a positive opinion. Um, and now more than ever um, is the time a positive opinion um, could make a real difference. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Alex. That's uh, enlightening and, and uh, helpful. Um, I'm actually quite interested that none of you went into the, the actual danger of reinterpretation as, uh, of the question, as it happened in the Kosovo um, advisory opinion, which is another, um, which is another danger that, can, that, that, that is here, because that was a combination of watering down of the question being asked in the General Assembly in order to achieve the requisite majority, and then using the ICJ, pretty much using that watered down um, version of the question to just basically wiggle um, its way out of having to say anything of import. Um, and, um, and that's, I think, a, a real danger um, as well, but perha perhaps we can come back to it um, in, uh, the, um, in the discussion uh, now, I can see that there are a number of people that have sent um, in questions in the, in the chat. Um, can I ask uh, Sonia McKay if she would like to um, ask uh, her question uh, live? Uh, please obviously keep it uh, as short as possible possible for it to make sense um because i see you putting quite a lot in the chat yeah sorry oh, apolog yeah apologies can you actually hear me we can actually hear you just fine sorry um i'm actually speaking from australia so i'm not against australia i'm a resident in australia um but there are a lot of australians that are also concerned about the climate issue and the damage to disproportionately to um, developing countries. Um, so in response to the COVID led gas fired recovery, um, which is going to exacerbate um, global warming, um, I did um, pose the question to um, a professor that I was um, dealing with in my subject with international environmental law. So I actually did a subject on this and she gave for the overall subject 99% for, for my, um, for my um, overall mark. Um, so I'm guessing I'm on the right um, projection at least and why I was Thank you, Sonia. Can asking you... the question. If the question is, um, can, or have you thought about taking countries such as Australia to the International Court of Justice under the idea of the no harm principle. Now that no harm principle also entails the prevention principle. Um, we already know that we're talking about irreversible harms when we're talking about reports from the IPCC. Um, so we're talking about ecosystems having irreversible harms. We're talking about tipping points already being activated with the possibility of continuing on. Um, and whether or not also um, a Pacific Island country could take on um, this court action on behalf of all, which um, it has been done under the nuclear cases, um, or tried to under the nuclear cases, um, and also whether or not that could include um, also nature, because countries such as Bolivia have already designated Mother Earth with personhood. 
So the idea of a Pacific Island country or a developing country taking a developed country, which is supposed to be leading the way towards taking us to under two degree towards that 1.5 degree under the Paris Agreement, um, I just think is a really essential idea, particularly um, in re regards Thank to a binding decision. Thank you, Sonia. Let's try and keep it a little bit short because there were a lot of questions there and we might want to give panelists an opportunity to answer and other people to ask as well. So thank you very much. Um, um, shall we, um, um, is there anyone who would like to, to address this now or shall we collect a few more questions and, and then uh, do a round with the panelists um, in uh, having them address whatever questions they want? We do have until... Uh, uh, 30 past is that is that correct uh and so we have uh, sometimes so um um ooh, here's an interesting one maria ermida um uh, can you ask this question as well because that's uh, i also was thinking that um and have some views on that but then again i have some views on everything so um uh, so that's okay so maria ermida you have the floor can you hear me we can hear you just okay. fine. uh thank you i Thank you so much for this very interesting webinar and for the very interesting uh, inputs. Uh, I would like to ask, ask to keep it short if the ITLUS should actually have something to say in these issues and uh, taking into account the advisory opinions that it has already produced and if the, the same harm that we have discussed, the same um, negative impacts of, of the, um, that could uh, hover over an ICJ advisory opinion would also be applicable to the ITLUS. Thank you. So I was I was also thinking. I mean, there's um, and there's lots of answers to that, and I'm, I'm sure the panelists will uh, will give some of them. Um, uh, but I was also thinking about it. So thank you, Maria, for that. Um, we have um, another question. Um, Um, by uh, Pau de Vilches Moragues. Sorry, sir, for the sir for the pronunciation of your name, but then again, try pronouncing mine. Uh, would you, um, which is on causation, which I think is uh, also interesting. Uh, Pau, would you like to answer your question uh, live? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Thank you. Great. So um, I was listening uh, to, to Alex's presentation and I thought it was impressive. And, and, and when he talked about causation, um, that made me think that in, in many domestic climate litigation cases, causation has been dealt with by courts uh, saying that, okay, even if their contribution has been very low, it's been relevant in terms of increasing the risk and they are liable to protect their own people. So they, they shouldn't contribute to to potential harm. And this in cases where uh, national greenhouse gas emissions have been less than 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, don't you think that uh, an advisory opinion by the ICJ could in a way uh, rise the threshold and thus pose a challenge to future domestic climate litigation? Could we imagine that the ICJ says something like, okay, less than 5% contribution uh, wouldn't be uh, significant enough. So my, my reflection is, could an advisory opinion be uh, in fact a blow to domestic actual litigation in terms of climate change, which has been quite successful so far. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pao. Um, shall I um, uh, try and go around um, the panelists for a first round of answers before we accumulate too many questions because now they're coming in. Um, and some of them are really interesting. Um, and I'll take it in reverse order, if that's all right. Um, so shall I start with you, Alex? Is there uh, <clears throat> anything what you've heard that you would like to address? Uh, yep, certainly. Um, so um, one state taking another to the ICJ, that's of course the alternative to an advisory opinion that, that we haven't been discussing so far. Um, and it has been um, discussed um, for some time um, in academia. Um, but I think in my view, it was probably more difficult to do that than it is to get an advisory opinion because uh, first of all you have the jurisdictional um, question um, which is likely to um, well I, I can't think of a case where that wouldn't be likely to, to scupper a case but will, it would depend on the individual state so you have to select very carefully the, um, the state you go after uh, to make sure you're not tripped up on jurisdiction 
there's also difficult um, questions of, of provisional measures. Um, and again, as we've just heard, that the caus causation issue, when you're trying to say which state is, is responsible, then you can't really avoid the causation issue. Um, and again, it's more likely, I think, that you've got a risk of, a, of a, an unhelpful um, de decision there. Um, and then, of course, we have loss and damage, um, which, again, um, tricky issues. Um, clearly, these are things that it would be useful for the ICJ to provide sort of general guidance on. But I, I think that... Before we even get there, there might be even the, the issue of the existence of a dispute. Um, mm, and yes, if, of course. Yeah. And if the Marshall Islands case it teaches us anything is, mm. you know, it's not that easy to just wake up one day, um, and invent a dispute and, and go before the court. You've actually have had to, uh, you will have had to do some groundwork. Yeah, lay the that. groundwork. Exactly. Exactly. So I think ICJ advisory opinion, um, I think I think it's absolutely right. Um, and I think Aoife and Jewel, are, uh, you know, that's what they're after. And I think, I think they're right to, um, to seek that. Um, and again, just, just in terms of the implicit, I think there was a question about, okay, what are the implications for this in domestic climate litigation? I think it links to a broader question of, you know, what does the, what, what, what's the benefit um, of, an, of an ICJ decision on the, on the, on the, the domestic level? Um, and it also goes to the question about it loss as well. Personally, I think an ICJ opinion will be more useful because people in general, they, they sort of know what the ICJ is, right? They've heard of the World Court. They know that it's important. Where with it loss, I don't think it quite has that kind of impact um, on the domestic level, because first you have to explain to people um, what, what it loss is. Um, and just as an example of, of how powerful an ICJ ruling can be, um, Philippe Sands um, provides this great uh, um, anecdote um, about this um, market um, in Japan um, following um, the uh, the whaling decision, which put up a sign saying that in line with the findings of the ICJ, we have now asked market sellers to cease um, selling whale meat. And of course, the ICJ said nothing about the lawfulness of selling whale meat. It said nothing um, uh, directed at private actors. But the point is, people do take notice um, of the ICJ, and that's why it's such a, a powerful form and a way of you know advocating um, for these um, these key key issues. Um, and yes, just on the on the causation point, yes, yes, I I agree that there is obviously that the risk of a potentially unhelpful ICJ opinion for that very reason, um, because people listen to the ICJ, not just when it says things that are, that are potentially helpful, but if it says something unhelpful on causation as well, um, that might be something um, that's, um, that's used in domestic litigation. So that's a potential, um, a potential risk. But I think overall, uh, that the benefits of a, of a positive advisory opinion on this outweigh um, the, the risks um, of a negative advisory opinion. Uh, thank you, um, Alex. That's very helpful. I might add, um, uh, with respect to, to ITLOS, I think my worry would be not so much that people don't know it, because, you know, if it affects people, you can make everything uh, sort of like into a trend. Uh, that uh, sure, I mean, it, you know, if the whaling had come before the ITLOS, I'm sure that the, um, the you know, Japanese people would have taken note, uh, no matter what. Um, and whatever the court is. I think more of the, the problem with ITLOS might be more the fact that you would have to limit yourself to the law, to the law of the sea convention. Um, and of course, this is not a convention that's very well known for taking, uh, I mean, for, for its time, for, 19, for 1982, it was actually quite um, forward looking and, um, and, and there were some environmental concerns lurking down there, but their, their main issue was pollution actually, not, um, the environment or any sort of of, uh, of integrated approach. So I'm not sure how much you can make out of it um, without starting to to push really hard at the boundary. So may maybe that's why um, ITLOS it's not is not a very good idea. Though it might be slightly easier to go through ITLOS. Um, and Margarita. Yeah, thanks, Antonio, and thanks all for these questions. Um... Just a remark to complement Alex's answer on, uh, to, on Sonia's question. So um, besides speculation about uh, a potential contentious ICJ climate case, um, there has been at least one, um, one instance in which a state actually publicly um, considered suing other states before the ICJ. That was Tuvalu back in 2002, which openly considered um, Bringing, bringing a contentious case against the United States and Australia, which at the time were the only two industrialized nations that had not ratified the, the Kyoto Protocol. Um, that announcement was probably primarily symbolic, at least in relation to the United States, because of the unlikely prospects of the, of the US consenting to the ICJ's jurisdiction. 
which is almost certainly required for the court to hear the case. And that announcement was made and there was a change of government in Tuvalu and the initiative died out. And since we haven't had such announcement, announcements again, and again, yeah, for the reasons already mentioned, um, it's, um, it's not, it's not, um, it's not, of course, it's something that can, that can happen at any time, but it's, it's always a David and Goliath battle, battle and for the, um, for the David to maybe easier to build a coalition and go through the advisory route than it is to sue a powerful um, state on which it often depends also for, um, for financial assistance, including for adaptation. Um, and then on um, the oh the risk of um, let me let me address that question as well the risk of um, um, securing or of getting an opinion that would undermine domestic climate litigation because of unhelpful pronouncements on causation. My own view is that the risk there is not necessarily that great because um, in the end the um, as opposed to domestic courts, the, the ICJ applies international law. What it looks at when it comes to causation is the, the law state responsibility. And there's really no causation requirements in the law state responsibility. There's just two things that are required. It's a, it's an, a legal obligation and you know and evidence that the obligation has been breached. And um, we know that from following the, the process of how the, the articles came about that this is a deliberate omission the, the ICJ or the, the ILC at the time realized that, that including a causation requirement make it very difficult to enforce um, obligations of prevention and recognize the importance of these obligations. So the requirement is not there. There is a causation requirement, of course, in the part of the articles that deals with reparations. So in order to secure reparation for injury, the state does need to prove that the harm is caused by the wrongful act, but the establishment of a wrongful act as such is not dependent on causation. So um, in, in that sense, there are two different levels of causation. So let's let's perhaps keep that clear. There might be causation requirements for breaching the primary rule, just like there may, might be damage requirements for breaching the primary rule, just like there might be intent, intent requirements for breaching the primary rule. But these are all in the primary rule. It's not just a part of, of state responsibility, right? Um, if, if you stop without reason in the territorial sea, it doesn't matter whether you intended to stop or you didn't intend to stop. It doesn't matter whether you caused any damage or not. The primary rule doesn't require anything like this. Um, uh, and, so, and so in that sense, it's a question for the primary rule. Other, uh, it can be breached without causation, damage, or, or intent um, in that sense. And then there are other rules that require these things. Um, so it's one question for the primary rule, if there are issues there, and there's another question at the level of state responsibility with relation to injury causing um, uh, damage that needs to be compensated. Yes, very true. But, um, so both, I think most of the obligations that are looked at here are prevention obligations and, and do not require causation. So when you look at um, Due diligence, for example, mitigation obligations under the convention, um, human rights obligations. Human rights, of course, deal with causation in a different way, where there's often a victim requirement in mitigation. So that is then that implies that you need to be able to prove some form of causation. But if it's an advisory opinion, you get around that issue. Um, and it loss, yeah, on it loss, perhaps just to add one more point is that it loss, of course, um, an, an it loss advisory opinion wouldn't apply directly to the United States of America. And uh, an ICJ advisory opinion always applies to all UN member states. So that's another advantage, probably, of um, an ICJ advisory opinion compared to... Well, well, it also doesn't, because it's not binding on any member states at all. Uh, at most, it's binding on the organization. Exactly. It's not binding, it's authoritative. Oh, well, if it's authoritative, then ITLOS is as authoritative for the United States as it is for anybody else. Because, of course, the United States would tell you, we agree that all of the substantive provisions in the Law of the Sea Convention are actually customary law. So here you are. Um, so I'm not sure that that's the difference. But while we're on the point, can I bring in, um, because there's, there seems to be a set of questions with, why are you going to the ICJ? Why not go to, so we've discussed, why not go to ITLOS? And here we have, 
A couple of other questions. Is it okay that in the interest of time, I won't give you the floor? Um, uh, 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 but James Harrison is asking, so why not push for um, a general comment from one of the UN human rights treaty bodies or an advisory opinion from a regional human rights court, like the European Court of Human Rights, for example, or the um, uh, Inter-American Court of Human Rights? Uh, even if the impact of such a decision would be limited to a single treaty, that's true. In practice, uh, uh, the jurisprudence of regional courts um, can have a broader effect, says uh, James Harrison. So especially if uh, you, um, if and you are really interested in bringing out the human rights aspect of the whole thing, um, why not push for a general comment from a UN human, human rights treaty body? Um, or regional human rights court. That's um, that's another question. So I'll go to our panelists and and to you, if and Jules, for um, general comments on this and everything that's been asked so far. But the other one, the other relevant question, um, is from uh, Miss Ella Ella Goose. Um, and I'm not sure what the first name is, but if I can just uh, go through it, it says. Um, how could the successes that the environmental uh, that the environmentalists have achieved at national levels, um, for example, the agenda case in, in, in the Netherlands, uh, how can these successes be transposed to litigation at international level? And how do you see the possibility of the success of climate justice case before the European Court of Human Rights? So here again, the, the European Court of Human Rights. So um, perhaps we can... Um, we can try and address these issues, having addressed uh, just ITLOS, uh, to see other other courts and possibilities. Uh, sorry, let me now start with uh, Jewel and 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 Ifa and and circle back to um, uh, all the way to Alex. So, uh, uh, Jewel and Ifa, anything that we've said that we've been that we have been asked so far, if you would like to comment on any of this, um, now is the time. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I think I would like to comment on uh, why we're choosing the ICJ and an advice your opinion route. Um, I think we're, what we're trying to do is really bring in young people from around the world to uh, advocate within their countries, within their regions uh, for the, their protection from rising sea levels and from other climate, adverse climate change impacts. And the ICJ as the court of the UN is really um, we, it's really uh, il um, sort of illustrative for young people to imagine that turning to the UN's court uh, for protection uh, is really something youth can get behind. Um, so also in relation to, uh, to uh, a comment from a human rights body, why we're also looking at the ICJs because in the past, uh, well, states can make submissions and in the past states have given uh, their speaking time for victims of uh, of the issue at hand. And I think also in relation to climate change and this being a youth-led effort, I think it would be extremely powerful if countries uh, would bring in young people who are the victim of adverse climate impacts to speak about why this issue is a human rights issue, why this issue impacts their lives and the, the lives of future generations. So I think that for us is also a really an important, uh, an important argument in going to the ICJ and um, I think um, the the legal side I think is only one part of uh, a very important part but it's only one part of the impact that an advisory opinion can have and if young people can see uh, that the UN court is um, giving an will give an advisory opinion that can protect them I think that's also something that can be carried out also in the years after the advisory opinion has been given that young people can really hold their states uh, accountable for what the ICJ has said uh, yeah and I'd just like to quickly add that, that I don't uh, I don't think we have to decide either or there has been support for this campaign and the students in the Pacific are working so tirelessly to to push for this and a lot of people are very receptive of the idea and I do think I mean considering that climate change negotiations have been going on for so long and all these climate cases and uh, there were so many climate cases brought before different courts and some succeed and many don't and we can as a global community we we keep developing and building upon successes and failures of, of, of past cases so we consider this really just a piece of of the global progress towards 
climate justice in, in different shapes and forms. So if there is a campaign wanting to get um, a state owned by a, a UN human rights treaty body, then that would be great as well. So yeah, um, don't think we would have to decide against anything, but this, um, yeah, one route for all the reasons that Aoife has mentioned and others have mentioned, we believe is, um, can be very powerful. Thanks, and that makes sense. Of course, there is the there is the strategy that says just uh, nail it wherever you can. So it was sure, European Court of Human Rights. Why not? Um, in that context, we might want to think um, whether we we're not uh, to some extent forgetting domestic courts. I mean, the Heathrow litigation has been quite important regarding the status of the Paris Agreement in 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 the UK. So, I mean, these these can also have quite an effect. But perhaps we'll come back to that. Um, thanks for that, Ifa and Jewel. Um, shall we go back to, to Margarita? Uh, in, uh, do you have anything to add regarding sort of like other fora um, where the question can be pursued, uh, Margarita? Or, uh... Well, thankfully, it's, it's not us who, who decides on that. Um, it's very much bottom up. So, um, you know, litigants are taking initiatives and sometimes, um, you know, Courts and quasi-judicial bodies are also taking their own initiatives. So, um, and, and often, often uh, these efforts are complementary. Always, of course, if you make a decision whether or not to litigate or to bring a certain initiative, it's good to evaluate the landscape and see how this may interact with other initiatives. But generally speaking, it seems that the effects um, of cases on other cases or initiatives on other initiatives is more positive than negative. So, when it comes to a general comment, for example. There may, I think it's probably a question of time before there will be a question, uh, a general comment from one of the treaty bodies on on climate change. Um, but it's um, we we have a, we have quite a bit of output already. The first statement from a treaty body on climate change dates back to 2009 in the CEDAW, the Commission, the Commission uh, Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, issued a statement on gender and climate change back then, and we have several joint statements as well from UN treaty bodies. We have several reports from UN Special Rapporteurs of the Human Rights Council. And of course, we have an advisory opinion already from the Inter-American um, Court of Human Rights on Human Rights and the Environment, very powerful and helpful. Um, so all of this is, is happening. And I don't think that, um, that um, it would be wise to say that we may forget and, and, and we don't pursue an ICJ advisory opinion because we want something from a human rights body. But um, these will be important, and these could also feed into an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice, of course. Um, yeah, so let me leave it here. Thank you, uh, Margarita. Alex, any uh, views? Oh, just just briefly, yes, I completely agree um, with Margarita and, and Julia. It isn't um, an evil rule, and we should be doing all of these things because they uh, they feed off each other. I and mean, I agree with you, Antonio. So we see the impact of an interest impact of an interest in um, domestic cases on environmental law, for example, in the UK and the Netherlands. Um, and I think we certainly shouldn't underestimate um, the effects of a, of a positive um, domestic environmental ruling, particularly at the highest level. At the very least, it can inspire litigation um, at, elsewhere and get a sort of consensus, which is which is really very important. Um, I just want to just comment very briefly on the European Court of Human Rights. And that's an important um, but tricky question because of course there's no specific environmental um, right. Um, I know the South African constitution, for example, has specific um, environmental rights, but we don't have that um, with the um, European um, Court as yet. Um, so it's a, a case of tying the environmental issues to an existing right, for example, the, um, the right to life, um, which we, uh, we are starting to see, for example, in the UK this year, we had a very important coroner's report um, in London, um, which said that air pollution materially contributed um, to the death um, of, a, um, of a young girl who, who had asthma, for example. Um, so you can see where these um, air pollution um, carbon issues can tie into existing rights, um, but we have to be a bit more creative with the way um, we phrase it at the European Court of Human Rights, because we don't have a, a specific environmental um, um, complaint um, to make, it has to tie to something else. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, also, let's not forget that domestic courts, you know, uh, in the case of domestic courts, they're not just a legal opinion, they're also state practice. Um, and to that extent, that, that might be even more um, uh, sort of impactful 
if you have enough courts uh, doing and at, a, and at a relatively high level doing a particular thing, but they are state practice, so that's important. Can I move, can I single out a question and with apologies to Toby Fisher who's asking it, I will uh, not invite uh, uh, them to, to, answer, to ask it live because I wanna cut the second part because I think the first part is so powerfully put um, and so uh, succinctly and, and very well put that I, I would like to, answer, to, to hear the answers of our panel to this. What does success look like in a potential ICJ advisory opinion? And what is the worst, ca worst case outcome from such an opinion? I think that's, that's wonderful. I mean, that could be the title of, of an article. What does success look like in an ICJ advisory opinion and off the top of my head i can't answer it so um <laughs> so would anybody um i mean i have some thoughts and, and i'm happy to discuss them but would anybody like to, to to pick that one up and try and tell us what success might look like in an icj advisory opinion not generally in this particular advisory opinion what what would we think would be a successful when will will we have succeeded when the court says what so perhaps we can start again with um, Rifa and Jewel, not, not in any sort of technical manner, right? But you having been at be, being spearheading this initiative, wanting to go to the ICJ, wanting to convince the states to go to the ICJ, to ask a question, having, having even views about the question, um, which I think is fantastic. What would success look like for you? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, we are, uh, for us, really, the intersection of climate law and human rights law is very important. And that's why we're, our uh, campaign is called World's Youth for Climate Justice. So we're really looking at uh, what, what does climate justice mean? And I think, as was mentioned before, intergenerational equity is a really big part uh, of that. So having clarification on what does intergenerational equity mean um, with in terms of the legal side would be very important for us. Um, I think also, I, I am gonna go briefly into the technical side because I think as I mentioned before, having uh, young people um, being part of the oral submissions of states and really being able to be part of uh, the, the, this ICJ advisory opinion, I think is really powerful that uh, it's really young people being looking for protection uh, at the court of the UN and uh, being part of the oral submissions there. And I think if if the advisory opinion would be helpful in terms of uh, defining intergenerational equity or, uh, or uh, other legal principles, then um, I think since young people around the world are advocating for an advisory opinion, it would also be a success for me if afterwards young people are also um, can really sort of hold this advisory opinion as uh, as their success and sort of look at their governments or um, to say, we advocated for this, we received this, and now, um, uh, yeah, it's time that, uh, it's time that um, states uh, follow up on those, uh, on those principles. Thanks, Eva. Uh, Jill, no, no, no further contribution there from you? Okay. Uh, um, um, shall we go Alex Margarita this time around? Yep. Yes. Yep, certainly. A, a tricky question. And I expect nothing less from a, from a landmark chambers um, colleague, Toby Fisher. Um, so I think what I'd like to see um, would be a strong statement um, of the customary status of specific obligations um, relating to emissions. I think, I think that would be great. Basically, something we can wave at states and say, if you don't do this, you're breaching international law, because that's always a bit more powerful than saying, if you don't do this, you know, we'll write you a very angry letter telling you how angry we are and how important that that is. And I like something on customary international law because it can, um, customary international law can have this sort of useful freezing effect that can, as I mentioned, prevent later regression, um, or at least it's a stick that we can wave at regressors, um, which doesn't seem that useful if your view of history um, is that things are always improving. Um, but as we saw with the US pulling out of the Paris Agreement, that isn't necessarily um, the case. Um, and with my human rights lawyer hat on, um, when you have the most basic low and lowest common denominator standards, um, that can still be useful, um, as, as even then there are people, states, uh, who 
who want to depart from those standards and those are often the ones we need to worry about the most um, so I, i'd like to see something about the customary status um, of of the obligations relating to um, emissions thanks margarita yeah, I, I was going to mention that too um and in, in, in addition to that, um, so customary law obligations relating to uh, mitigation, uh, clarification, and confirming that customary law states would be very useful. Um, but in addition to that, um, something on equity could be very useful. CBDR is, of course, um, very much uh, open to various different interpretations, and that's why it doesn't have the impact that it, that it could have. So clarification on how um, responsibility for mitigation is to be um, dis like distributed or apportioned between states would be very helpful. And, and, and of course, the, you know, one super helpful outcome that is also perhaps um, difficult, very difficult to achieve is something so as specific as state responsibility is proportionate to their historical contributions to greenhouse gas emissions that would be very specific. And you could do a lot with that in the, in the, in the climate negotiations as well as in mitigation and then of course also on reparation if you would get the court to say um, that something about states obligations to make reparations for harm caused by climate change that would be tremendously helpful especially for uh, climate vulnerable states these are, this is also very difficult to achieve something on mitigation a little bit more generic maybe maybe easier um, and also creates has creates a lower risk of getting a bad outcome. Um, so that may be a trade off. How how far do you push, push? How ambitious are you? Because probably the more ambitious you are in asking the question, the higher the chance that the answer is not the answer that that you are hoping for. Uh, if I may um, sort of come back to to that. So in my view. ITLO's experience here can be important um, in terms of defining what, what is success in the request for an advisory opinion. Um, and I think both advisory opinions given by ITLO's uh, on, um, on fisheries and on the um, 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 and on the responsibilities, the obligations and uh, responsibilities of uh, states uh, sp sponsoring uh, persons and entities with respect to activities in the area, which was really a dark area of the law. Um, in a way, the area being the international seabed, obviously, um, uh, and, and one that wasn't explored um, to enough depth. I think uh, th this is what in our case would look like a success in an advisory opinion, asking very specifically about the status scope and content of particular rules um, and um, the, um, the implications um, of those rules for particular states acting in a particular manner, because the, otherwise the, 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 the threat or the, the danger um, that we face um, is precisely that we are going to have um, a nuclear weapons advisory opinion all over again. And that's generally the danger with advisory opinions. Um, and, and this is why they're also, to some extent, the common lawyers, um, they, they seem like quite a peculiar, peculiar animal. They're like, so you have a court, but no actual facts um, on which the law should be applied. Just you ask them to advise. How odd is that? So um, what happened in the nuclear weapons advisory opinion was in part that the court, court said, look, I can see all sorts of rules here. I, there is no general rule that prohibits them. There might be a matrix of rules whose effect would be to prohibit nuclear weapons in general. However, looking at that matrix of rules, I can't just imagine any, um, all possible factual constellations in order to be able to say with any certainty that, there, that there is no factual constellation in which a nuclear weapon can be used. And that's a bit the problem with an advisory opinion on climate change, that what are the factual constellations that we can imagine playing out with respect to various rules. Um, so the more general we make it, the more difficult it becomes. The more specific we try to make it, focusing on particular rules in particular circumstances, a bit like um, the, the Itlo-Sibets dispute chamber had to do in the case of activities in the area, 
um, the more important it is. And that's another, another advisory opinion, by the way, that has to do with the environment because it deals with environmental damage in the international seabed, but there we are. Um, I'm um, sorry, I stole the last word there um, uh, in a way, but uh, perhaps I can, uh, we're coming now to the end, so we only have a couple of minutes left. So perhaps I can pass this uh, uh, back to Konstantinos, who's going to um, talk to us um, about the rest of the series uh, and so on. Um, I'd like to thank, um, obviously, Alex uh, and Margaret, our panelists, for bring, bringing their expertise to bear here. I'd like to thank all attendees for the interesting uh, questions um, that they've submitted, and I hope we covered as many of them as we could. Um, and. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the British Institute for International uh, and Comparative Law for hosting this uh, uh, fantastic seminar. And uh, most of all, I'd like to thank Ifan Jewel for, um, uh, well, for everything really. Um, we hope you uh, keep on pushing uh, because if we have any hope of being saved, it is uh, with you guys uh, and, and people your age pushing the envelope. So thank you very much. Gonzadinos? Well, thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Zanagopoulos, Professor Wiwari Gessing, uh, Dr. Shadok, Aifi and Joe, thank you so much for this enlightening and thought-provoking discussion. I definitely learned a lot about all the various risks and possibilities of pursuing an advisory opinion on uh, climate-induced sea level rise and issues of intergenerational equity from international courts and tribunals. A, hu a huge thanks to every one of you watching this live stream and participating in the discussion. And of course, many thanks to Tim Bickle and Landmark Chambers for supporting this series. Thank you all very much. Please stay safe and see you next week for our next episode on rising sea levels, climate displacement as a human right violation. And with this, we close today's session. Thank you so much.